morning. First of all, to be able to distinguish two realms and two councils. In fact, three. Uh, be able to better define the image of God and then to discover God's plan for the future of the world. All right, on page 27 of the book, God's rule in the unseen spiritual world through his counsel is a template for his rule on earth, what theologians call the kingdom of God. In other words, the invisible world sets the pattern for how God works in the visible world. Now to kind of give a general setting for this discussion and what's coming eventually, let's just consider a moment of biblical cosmology, which isn't too different from our scientific view. Uh, first of all, right across the middle, we see that there's, there's the Earth, that's the, the Eretz, as they say. And there are two bodies of water revealed in the book of Genesis and other passages. The waters above, which you and I see on the Earth, and then there are the waters below. Some places are called the fountains of the deep. That's why Genesis 1 sets the stage for Genesis 7, the flood, where it says, the fountains of the deep broke open, the water blew up, fell back down as rain. Then we have the heavens. Now, in our speech, when we talk about sky or heaven, where do we look for it? Up. Up. In the biblical perspective, it starts where? Ground land. It goes up from there. <coughs> and so uh, much of what the scriptures ascribe to the, the heavens can be very near to us, including the divine counsel in the heavenly places, might be in our midst. And then there will be mention of mountains uh, in the text. The mountains in antiquity were generally considered to be the geographical place where gods dwelt. And then down at the bottom we have Sheol, sometimes called the underworld, where departed humans, spirits, and perhaps even beasts went. So in the, in the scripture, there's no idea of death being the end of anything. It just simply lost and separated. Now before we get into the Eden story, I thought we'd better stop and consider that there are different views on what was going on in that account, even amongst Christians. Now, here's one that is popular amongst evangelicals and especially young earth creationists. Uh, this is an historical account of an actual place where real events occurred and the persons really existed. If this is your view, welcome. Uh, secondly, there are those who consider this to be pure folklore. That is to say, a kind of fable that we can safely ignore. If you hold that view, just be patient. Uh, thirdly, some consider this, the Bible, to be great literature. And whoever composed Genesis, either Moses or somebody named Moses, <laughs> this is a creative scenario to teach morality or to teach theology and accept it as that. So if that's your view, you'll be comfortable here. Others say, well, this is, this is mythology, not disparaging it, but rather this is an ancient Near Eastern beliefs borrowed by the Bible to communicate something about Israel's God, Yahweh. And much of the language and the descriptions and the events of Genesis can be found in ancient Near Eastern literature, some of it older than the Bible. And so they say, well, so some scholars say, that obviously the Bible borrowed the mythology of the ancient East and then put Yahweh as the, the central deity. Well, the Bible sometimes does that. A fifth possibility is, well, Genesis 1, is, it's a vision. God revealed past history to the Bible writers in very graphical, descriptive, uh, narrative form just as he did the future in the book of Revelation. You're wondering which of these I hold to? Here's my advice. Regardless of which view you hold, one of these or some other, 
Let's read the account for its own story and learn its teaching. Once you understand the teaching of Scripture, it often changes your perspective on what Scripture really is. Any question? Yes? Does, would one of these, your sections, include an <coughs> allegorical interpretation? Allegorical? Which of these would be allegorical? The, the vision one is The that. vision one would be allegorical. Almost all of them, except the, the actual history one. And even that, you can take, you can actually use real history as an allegory for something else. But we have an introduction to what some call the Garden of Eden, in Ezekiel 28, 12 through 13. Uh, this was given for the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre was an historical human individual, but the message for that king was given in terms of the spirit world. But he was living a very opulent life and abusing his power. And so scripture thought it was appropriate to use the historical Genesis account, the divine council members who were present in Eden to describe the, the situation. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. All right, whom do you think he's talking about? Now, the term for serpent in Genesis, by the way, nachash, primary meaning is shining. Sometimes used for serpents if they happen to have very shiny skin. And so this came to be used as, in, uh, in, in biblical parlance and in other literatures, to represent the enemy of God, who is a great, powerful spirit, who is extremely beautiful, an angel of light, if you will, now, full of wisdom, he needed all the insight required. You were in Eden, defined as the garden of God. Why the garden? Well, in antiquity, gardens are where kings lived, spent their time. And they were lush and beautiful and fruitful and comfortable. And so the garden of God is where, who spends his time? Who dwells there? God. God, exactly. <laughs> so this was his dwelling place at a known place on the earth. We'll look down now to verse 14. Now, when we ask you to read aloud, a couple of reasons for that. One is so that others can participate, get a different voice, make sure that those who aren't paying attention hear the scripture, but we are also proclaiming the word of God into the spirit realm. You were ordained as a guardian sheriff, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God, you walk among the fiery stones. The garden of God is now called the mountain of God. Why the sudden change? Of course, if you understand Hebrew poetry, you know that terms are often used in parallel because they overlap in their meaning or in their reference. So how can you take garden and mountain and put them together? A mountain garden. Yeah. They're, they're both places where kings live. They're both places where kings live, exactly. And more to the point, mountains are where gods dwelt. Trying to put these together in Mesopotamia. By the way, the, the luscious, most productive, beautiful region of the, of the ancient Near East, called the Fertile Crescent, it's still the nicest place in the region. Or it can be seasonally. And so some have suggested that the Garden of Eden may have overlapped the center of the lush portion of the Near East and the mountains up in Armenia and Turkey. Both of those terms were very appropriate geographically. Now, there's a big question that we have to deal with. Who was present at the creation of human beings? Which one? <laughs> not lady angels. Not lady angels. <laughs> No. Let's get right into it. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Hmm. Does that pose any problems for you? The plural. The plural, yeah. Who was God talking to when he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness? Well, just for the moment, let's say there was more than one, possibly more than one party present. And we have to deal with what is the image of God? And some of our best philosophy comes out of assigning meanings to the image out of our best intellectual speculation. 
when I laid the earth's foundation, while the morning stars sang together, and all the angels, the sons of God, shouted for joy. All right, the morning stars sang. All right, the morning stars is an ancient Near Eastern expression for spiritual beings up in the sky. And as the planets and the stars would move about, these seem to look like the movements of various kinds of spiritual beings or even deities. All the angels shouted for joy. Do any of your Bible versions say anything other than angels? Sons of God. Sons of God. All right. Yeah, exactly. That's what it says. Remember the term sons in the Bible usually does not mean male children. Only if it's talking about children does it mean male child. Uh, the term usually means the member of a group. The sons of Israel, Israeli citizens, the sons of the prophets, those were seminary students, members of the prophetic guild. And so discretion seems to be the members of uh, that set of beings whom we call the Elohim. Apparently they were there present at the creation. The sons of God saw the daughters of human were beautiful. Right, okay. So here are these sons of God had popped up in Genesis chapter 6. Well, it depends on when Job was written, you know, which one borrowed from the other. But the phrase, the sons of God, was present throughout the Hebrew language and it's an expression used in other Near Eastern mythologies and languages, some of them very similar to Hebrew. The sons of God used human women to produce a new race on earth to replace the human beings. Beings who would be in submission to the sons of God. We don't know how they did it, especially since these are spiritual beings, but our scientists can do that today. In fact, some can think that perhaps the sons of God are back and they're trying to use transhumanism to create a new race driven by artificial intelligence that will replace most of us. In Genesis 3 1, this is an easy one. Nicholas? Sermon said to the woman. Oh, this individual translated sermon, he was there also as the Garden of Eden was being set up, the animals created, put in the garden, and uh, this individual comes and speaks to the woman. There's a good reason for that. It has nothing to do with women being more susceptible to deceit. In fact, if you survive this long as a woman, you have de become a good detector of deceit. <laughs> uh, has more to do with responsibility, not authority. So what did the serpent look like? What did... <laughs> well, the New Testament says he can appear as a brilliant angel. He does not look dark and sinister with horns and an insect-looking face. You were in Eden, a garden cherub, from the day you were created. It's okay, there were beings called cherubs that were also present in that garden. And of course, again, this is speaking to some great enemy spirit of, uh, of God. We have a little exercise for you in your tiny groups. And if you're not in a tiny group, cycle up to one and read together Genesis 1, 24 through 25 and look for some things. Who are the two subjects of verbs? I tried this at home with a volunteer who couldn't figure out the second one for a while. And then, who commanded to take action? Who performed that action? And then formulate a summary statement. All right, thank you for your participation. Uh, let's, uh, let's start over here. Uh, what's one thing you found in that text? likes to repeat himself. <clears throat> he's doing that over and over again. And so he's making this self-sustaining system of the animals reproducing each other. Okay. Yes, that's a good point. It's a self-replicating system of likeness after likeness. Okay. Something else. This Did you repeat what she said? Yes, uh, the Lord was setting up a self-replicating system of generations that will be able to reproduce themselves. That that commandment, well, we know it came from God. All right, the command gave to, from God. Which person did the that's, that's a good question, but what the text reveals, what did you observe? Yeah, it was good. good. It was good. It 
being a pronoun, it probably relates back to what noun? The plan. Well, Jill had the, the interesting observation. This is primarily about a couple of translations say the land uh, bringing forth land dwelling creatures right. because other places say that the, the waters brought forth fish and the air brought forth flying creatures. That's all right, good, yeah. A, a nice evolutionist would say, hey, he's right on target at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but there's more. Anything else you observe over here? The commanded action was to bring forth life. Who did it? God did it. Lord, he sets up the pattern, he sets up the command, this is what he wants to happen, but the land cannot do it. So, the Lord does it. And once he has set up the reproductive capacity within his creatures, they take it from there. So, this is the main point that's, that's taken to the next passage, is that Yahweh gives a command, but he's the only one who can do it. Uh, as a summary, God has a plan for the natural realm, although he orders creatures, make that a plural, to multiply, only he has the power to create them. Let's take the next two verses, read the text aloud. Who are the subjects of the first verb? Who alone performed the first verb? Who are the subjects of the second verb? In these two verses, who share in a same image? I may interrupt you for a moment. Once you've got that all figured out, the final question is, what is the image? And do not guess. <laughs> it's right, it's revealed right there in the verses what it means to be the image of God. Take another minute, find what image means. Let's come back. Thank you for your participation. Now, the image of God may be much more than what is in the verse, but we do want to focus in on what the image meant in this context. So, uh, who are the subjects of the first verb? Hmm? Us. As in well, like us, God, us God. yes. Okay. That's a pronoun. So, is there any noun that comes before it? God. It includes God. And whoever this second party is, anyone else? who shares in this image. So we have two parties involved who are to take an action to make a human, but who alone then, who alone performed the action? God. 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 Hey, next Sunday, let's do lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's on you. <laughs> the ladies will prepare it. <laughs> okay? So just as God had said, let the land bring forth life, only God can do it. So he now says to these, this other party or parties, let's make mankind or humans or Adam, but only he can do it. He alone has the creative power. And that's an important lesson that we should take away from this. Of all the supernatural beings that exist, and all of those that are called gods in scripture, none of them compares to Yahweh in his creative power. So then, the, su the subjects of the second verb? <laughs> Men. Men. Yeah, right, yes. Men. The third party who shares in the image are the humans who are about to be created. So you get, you get the point? There are three levels of image. There's Yahweh, God. This is, his, this is what he is. And then there's the second level of these other beings who are present with him who also share in that image and now the human beings, oh, they get to share the image as well. So, what do we have going on here? Three levels of existence. And so Yahweh, he is so superior to the, to the gods of the heathen that they cannot even compare with him. In fact, he, they owe their existence to him. Well, what did you find? What is the image, according to this verse? This verse? Rolling the planet. Yeah, having, having dominion. Exactly. Yes, they, the humans now are given dominion over the new birth, and they're to rule over it. 
as stewards. And so being in the image of God is less some characteristic that we have as the prerogative, the rule, the authority from Yahweh to rule over the earth. As God and his counsel rule over the supernatural realm, so humans are to rule over the natural realm. The image is rulership. But there are other views. <laughs> Let's be honest, uh, not everyone's going to agree with that. So uh, typically, uh, theologians will wax eloquent, beautiful theology about how all of God's attributes are expressed through human beings, though in a lesser... It's nice to think about. God is living, we are... God is intelligent, we are God is, uh, compassionate, we can be... God is loving, we can pretend to love anyway. <laughs> There's some difficulties involved, of course, that after the fall, we do not all have those qualities to the same degree. And we can forfeit them. We can actually live in contrary to them. Then there is a religion afoot around the world these days that teaches that God is a glorified human who begets human children who in turn may become gods. It has not been lost upon the Europeans that the Americans created that religion. At a sociological level, some observe that humans are made by God, so should be respected despite their race or background. Okay, image of God. God created us humans, so we, we, every time we abuse, harm, or destroy a human being, we are tearing up God's photograph, or throwing darts at it, or spitting on it. In, in mythology, uh, certain societies feel that some humans were begotten by the gods, and so have special powers and privileges. You'll find that in many of the ancient societies, and you'll find it in, in South Asia to this day. And then there's a book of Genesis by which God created human beings to, to subdue and to rule the earthly realm as his imagers. We are imaging God's authority to rule. Messing it up pretty badly, however. <laughs> Humans in the divine council, believers in both the First and New Testament eras, could themselves be called sons of God. So the sons of Israel are also called God's son. Christian believers are said to now have been adopted by God as his children, and just as Jesus Christ is the heir or the inheritor of all things created, we become co-inheritors with him. Scripture says that we will participate in the divine nature. Apparently that was a current teaching amongst the early Christians, that God has destined us to participate in his nature in some new way. And what would that nature be? As imagers, restored. Anyway, book of Revelation says, we will exercise authority over the nations. We will even sit on Christ's throne. We will judge angels. Now the term, biblical term judge means more, to, more than to sit in a court, dispense sentences. God has seated us with him in the heavenly realms. English translations, that's a past tense verb. In Greek, it's not. It's a tenseless verb, just simply stating a truth, probably to be fulfilled then after his return seated with him in the heavenly realms. The new divine council. Three sets of divine imagers. We've already identified them. We're going to make humans in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. All right, second level, human beings in the natural realm. God created mankind in his own image. We actually are God's imagers. Often not doing a very good job, but and then there's the incarnate Son of God. He is the image of the invisible God. Some other interpretations. These come from uh, individuals and groups who think very deeply and seriously about these issues. The rabbinic view of this text. I actually looked up in a, a Jewish commentary to be sure. <laughs> God consulted with some unknown beings or entities. So this view were taken 
was actually quite current in rabbinic, that is to say, first temple, some refer to the pre-Christian era. That was the common understanding of those who read the Bible. Uh, then there's the mythological interpretation. Well, this image stuff, this is an idea borrowed from pagan polytheism. Well, Christians, now we don't get everything right all the time. Christians commonly say, well, it's the Trinity or the biunity agreeing on what to do. Commonly taught in churches because, well, if we took and understood that there is a divine council, it's just too spooky. And if we preached it from our pulpits to a, the public, they would walk out thinking these guys are out of their minds. So we kind of avoid it. Uh, why did I, where did this word biunity come from? Well, in what century did the Christians actually develop their doctrine of Trinity? The third of the fourth century? One of the big questions that Jews have often asked in scholarly circles is, why did so many of us so easily become Christians when we were monotheists? The considerable literature now come to realize that, oh, our forefathers already believed that there were two Yahwehs, the eternal Yahweh invisible in the heavens, and the second Yahweh who came down and appeared visible, calling himself the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. It was an easy shift, those who recognized Jesus as the Messiah, to say, oh, Jesus was the second Yahweh, now made flesh. And so that's called biunitarianism. The early Christians were biunitarian. But eventually it became so obvious that the Holy Spirit shares all the same attributes that, oh, well, there must be a third Yahweh, the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, the Holy Spirit is said to be Yahweh. Then there's the linguistic approach. This talk about let us make man, it's just the plural language of majesty. That's God's way of talking about himself as the, we are not pleased. Uh, then there's a literary approach. This plural talk is a rhetorical device <clears throat> to express divine prerogative. This view, oh, there's another one. Ha! Oh, uh, the literal view, God is exhorting himself. Let's do this. So, a kind of way to uh, summarize these things. But it seems that scripture has, reveals to us that there's a heavenly realm, an earthly realm, and eventually heaven and earth together. Well, in the heavenly realm, we have the divine council. In the earthly realm, back in the beginning, Adam walked with God and was able to see other divine beings and talk with them. Okay, we believe that there is a triune God who uh, rules over heaven and earth. In the heavenly realm, their task was to manage affairs in the heavens. In the earthly realm, humans were to subdue and rule the earth. Over in the heaven and earth category, the Son, Jesus, he's the one who redeems and reconciles. The spirits, many of them disobeyed. Adam, when he was tempted, he disobeyed, but Jesus obeyed completely. They will die like men, Psalm 82 says, of the fallen spirits. In the human realm, because of Adam, we all die. But Jesus died and rose. Some of the divine counsel, however, have remained loyal to Yahweh. Some humans do repent and remain faithful. And so what does God do? Well, he saves the repentant. He gives them new life, a new calling. Those who remain loyal, they remain in the divine counsel to this day, and apparently they will for eternity, the 24 elders. We humans who repented, we will join the divine council, and Jesus will be Lord of the divine council. God's kingdom is everlasting, <clears throat> Psalm 145 said. However, when Jesus came, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, he said, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. When Jesus was speaking to Jews, and never talked yet about his cross or resurrection, when he said, believe the gospel, he was talking about the Old Testament gospel that was preached to Abraham, that a time would come when the people of God would have land, a name, and all the Gentiles would be blessed. 
So you say, this is in hand, guys. It's starting now with me. And so this is, the book of Colossians says that you and I who trust Christ, we have been transferred from the realm of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Meanwhile, however, the powers of darkness are still at work. Then will come the end when Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Wait, wait. How could God put an end to all authority without destroying himself? But does he give up his power? Uh, no. That phrase, rule, authority, and power, in the New Testament, in the writings of Paul, always refers to the fallen members of the divine council who are destined for hell. Just a little more about Christ as the image of God. If image primarily means rule and authority, does Christ have rule and authority? Over what? Heaven and earth. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Yes. For in him all things were created. Right. The term here for firstborn normally means a person in position of authority, such as the firstborn in the family. And so if the context has nothing about birth order amongst children, then it has nothing to do with being born. It has everything to do with exalted top position authority within a family system. What did we say we learned last time? We are God's family. New family, yeah. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Uh, looks like our time is up, so we won't deal with Christians in the image of God, except to say that our new self is being renewed in the image of its creator, transformed into the image with everlasting, ever-increasing glory. We are predestined after faith to be conformed to the image of his Son, and mankind is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man.